or foolish enough to sign up for such a risky mission. Nobody else wanted the job. I remember his first meeting with the JPL Executive Council, and uh, he was no nonsense. He said, you know, when I come out to JPL, I, I see 6,000 people all clustered around a single spacecraft. He said, that's not the way to do business. Uh, that's Battlestar Galactica, and there aren't going to be any more Battlestar Galacticas. When I came here the first few times, it was with malice of forethought that I did everything. But let me give you some evidence. They were too cautious, so I used some theatrics. The Mars Surveyor was supposed to be faster, better, cheaper. Gravity works. <laughs> this is not the way to do things. There is no excuse for all this paper in that package. And what this package called out is the famous JPL Procurement Forms Manual. <laughs> now, do you want to spend your remaining days in the space program dealing with garbage like this? Who has the courage to say that this is unnecessary? This is not what we're about. We're about leaving Earth. We're not about paper. Just because there was a strategy behind Golden's theatrics. He wanted JPL to show how all of NASA could approach its work differently in the post-Cold War world. A concept Golden called faster, better, cheaper. Part of his charge was, in fact, to oversee the transition of the agency to a new direction, new scale missions, and science in particular. The Jet Propulsion Lab is going to be the catalyst to change the whole NASA space program. So I was trying to understand exactly what kinds of things he was trying to promote and how we could then make them real. Our job was to make them real. Everyone's tired of the shuttle going up and down. It's boring. My words was I wanted to darken the skies with a lot of satellites and spacecraft, and I wanted the American people to share in the excitement. And the first thing they did was the Mars Pathfinder. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's what we agreed to. 
Golden was not alone in his desire for change. And to revolutionize spacecraft development uh, in a way to drastically reduce cost while maintaining the capability... Wes Huntress was a former JPL scientist. He was now at NASA headquarters in charge of solar system missions and showing no hint of favoritism for the lab where he had worked for two decades. JPL was incredibly upset at me. They were so mad because I gave a mission to someone other than JPL. JPL felt at the time, we're the planetary program, we're gonna do all the flight missions, we should do all the flight missions because nobody else can do them like us. How could you possibly give a mission to somebody else? And the answer was real simple. And that's because your proposed cost was way too high. In the area of planetary exploration. With JPL's attention now fully engaged, Huntress offered up a challenge. JPL will give you a hard one, because you're good at hard ones. Uh, and that's landing something on Mars. And I want you to do it cheaply. Mars Pathfinder, as it came to be called, was to be a technology demonstration. The goal? proving that it was possible to land on Mars using airbags. And there was really no basis for knowing whether we could do it or not. We had no experience in that area. Uh, but we knew that if we didn't sign up for it, somebody who had less to lose than we did would sign up for it. And uh, we might just deal ourselves out of, the, out of the game. So we said, of course we can. The new coin of the realm are technology milestones. The established Huntress had another requirement. This new he wanted to name the project to manager. New missions. And when that technology There's only one person at JPL who's going to do this. Only one. Uh, and that's Tony Spear, because he's a maverick. Tony Spear was a JPL veteran, well known for being gregarious, enthusiastic, and forthright. I never felt like I belonged at JPL, ever, okay? I just, I came from a, a, a steel-working mining uh, family, you know? And when I was just overwhelmed by JPL, and so I had to bust my butt all the while. I was incredibly uh, intimidated. I couldn't understand one word that was being spoken. And I took acronyms home, lists of acronyms. Every night I would study these things, you know. Spears' inherent optimism, combined with feelings of being an outsider, would serve him well. He was being asked to land on Mars on a tight schedule of four years, with a budget less than a tenth of what the first NASA landings, the Vikings, had cost two decades earlier. Nobody else wanted the job, Mars Pathfinder. They were afraid to death of it. They were saying, you know, you're a crazy ass, Spear, for taking it. What are you going to do? And, and instead of being afraid, I don't know why, I got excited. I thought, oh my God, you know, uh, I'm climbing mountains and I'm doing this and that. And I says, I'll take it. <laughs> I will be a very close monitor of the time. Tony, you have 10 minutes. Um, we got a 10 minute late start, so I expect you would make it okay. all up. <laughs> John says I, he didn't care what I said, just get done in 10 minutes. Actually, I'm young. <laughs> I was good looking before I started this. It's, this is what happens. Um, here's one experiment coming up. We got this thing, and now we got to do it. <laughs> and. Uh, Pathfinder, uh, his major objective is to demonstrate a low-cost delivery system for landing things on Mars, okay? And uh, we use a Viking parachute. We use a Viking-like aeroshell. We use automobile-like airbags. We use Russian... I would show the simulation of the balls bouncing. And everybody in the room would laugh. They would giggle. Oh, my God. Give me a break. Anyway, uh, how, how am I doing, John? How much time? <laughs> Five more minutes. Good. Okay. I was thinking all the while, how the hell do you land on a planet? I had no idea. Some of the original ideas for an airbag landing were these back-of-the-envelope sketches. As the plan envisioned, 
Pathfinder dives into the Martian atmosphere at 16,000 miles per hour. Protected by its heat shield, the spacecraft burns through the Martian atmosphere, reducing its speed to 900 miles per hour. Next, a parachute is deployed. Then the heat shield and back shell are jettisoned, and a rope drops to detect the ground. The airbags inflate. Seconds later, the lander hits the surface at 50 miles per hour, bouncing stories high. After the lander finally comes to rest, the airbags deflate, and an antenna rises up, transmitting back to Earth the news that the lander is, somehow, still in one piece. One of Spears' first challenges was finding people willing to sign on for what seemed to many a career-ending mission. It wasn't easy to form that team. Uh, but once we got it, man, did they rock and roll. you know, an incredible um, gamble for all of th those young kids. You know, my career was already <laughs> established and over pretty much, but all those young kids I worried about, you know. The team wasn't entirely on its own. They had the full support of JPL's upper management. Veterans of the Viking mission provided tough but often useful guidance and technical components from JPL's current Battlestar Galactica, Cassini, were incorporated into the mission, helping to keep Pathfinder from busting its budget. Minimizing bureaucracy helped to keep down the costs too. We dumped paperwork that we just didn't think was necessary. We made sure we had the right paper. It was dramatically underfunded and it was understaffed. And what that created was tremendous opportunity. So if you got the right kind of person and they saw a job that needed doing and they had the ability to go, they just went and did it. Faster, better, cheaper missions are like uh, race cars. You gotta have one hell of a pit crew behind you and you need a really good driver. But if you crash, you're gonna crash and burn big time. And early on, there were some minor crashes. One involved an unusual test of the lander's aero shell. 
we had an engineer uh, who basically had the idea, he was a parachutist by hobby, and so he had decided we're gonna take a subscale version of this out, you know, of the heat shield, of the, the forebody, and the parachute, and I'm just gonna throw it out the back of a, of a plane. And then I'm gonna jump after it, and I'm gonna take pictures on the way down. It's very interesting given JPL today, right? You can edit all this out. The aeroshell, weighing over 200 pounds, almost immediately began tumbling out of control. Then the main parachute failed to open. A second parachute did unfurl, but it was attached to the heat shield. Meanwhile, the aeroshell smashed into the ground at an estimated speed of over 200 miles per hour. What happened? I just, I, I think what happened is the static line attachment broke. Because he had, he had, uh, the brake cord has to pull the canopy out. This is difficult and even embarrassing for us. Later, there was a second air mishap. A legendary one for which, unfortunately, there is no footage. It is remembered as the Pathfinder UFO. The story begins when a commercial contractor, while conducting a parachute test, accidentally dropped lead weights over a cucumber farm. One of the local newspapers had talked about the UFO incident, about when a cucumber farmer found a lead weight from potentially a UFO embedded in his truck. So that started the whole story. And it was funny the way your reactions went. So my reaction was, shh, let's not talk about it. It's a UFO incident, you know, it's a UFO incident. And, and finally our management said, there is no way you can't talk about this. We have to come clean. We made the farmer very happy. We bought him a new truck. And we promised him that for his daughter's birthday, we would fly over with a happy birthday sign. Now Caltech is really worried. <laughs> What are you doing, Spear? You know. Reining in the younger members of the team was one of the responsibilities of Brian Muirhead, a likable but hard-nosed technical leader. Would somebody pay attention to the management? No! 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 Brian was total nuts and bolts you know, get it done kind of a guy. And so, so that absolutely is what Tony had to have was somebody like that who could be his, his, his person to go off and clean up all the messes. If this is the surface of the atmosphere, we're coming in and we have to... I had never been a flight system manager. You know, I had delivered, you know, sizable things at the lab, but nothing like the flight system of a, of a spacecraft. Um, and it's the people that came around me on the flight system team, um, were they we kind of accreted a team of, of, of radical kind of thinkers. Muirhead was open to new ideas, but they had to be subjected to tried and true methods of proof, which is build it, test it, break it, fix it, do it again. But not everything could be fully tested. I was very scared of the parachute, I gotta tell you. Mostly was that parachute was the one thing we couldn't test in any realistic way. Assuming the parachute worked, the next challenge was knowing when to inflate the airbags, just seconds before hitting the ground. The original idea of hanging a rope with a sensor at the bottom proved unworkable, so radar was added. But that solution raised new problems. The devil is in the details. That's where I got into, into the picture, was in the devil's in the details. Like, for example, in some of the drop tests, of, you know, we do drop tests on parachutes and the, the radar was dropping and taking measurements, and it was swinging, like you would imagine that it would be swinging, and then we realized that uh, the radar, when it loses lock, it has all these horrible uh, altitude measurements that the radar tells you these are good measurements, but they are really bad. Release the item. 
To increase the chance of a safe landing, rockets were added in hopes of further slowing down the lander. So there was a, a set of steps we went through where smart people thought about how to make it more reliable, but it just kind of added more to the, here's something that goes into this basket and then that basket dumps into this tree. I mean, so it, it really gives you that Rube Goldberg sort of a feeling. Then there were the airbags. There we go, it's rolling off. It's going the wrong way. I remember working with Sandia. We used, they had the most powerful computer in the world at that time. And we brought it to its knees trying to simulate this airbag. In the early 1990s, computer processing capability was just getting good enough that we could imagine really bringing all of these simulation programs together. But there were certain parts of it we came to realize you really couldn't treat very well with a computer simulation. The airbags being by far and away the foremost example. I would guess that we didn't understand 90% of the fundamental physics that goes into the airbag. However, I would also argue that we didn't understand 50% at the end of Pathfinder. We're in the world's largest vacuum chamber, and we had the bags all the way up to the ceiling. It still wasn't enough distance to drop and get to the 23 meters per second impact velocity that we wanted. That's about 55, almost 60 miles an hour. So we had to design a, an acceleration system. Release. Release. And when we released it, they just flew down like a bat out of hell, and slammed into the platform and onto these huge rocks. And, you know, our worst fears were realized, and we got a pretty big tear in the bag. I don't think we cried. I came close to have tears in my eyes. There was one test in particular. We said, OK, there's a way to solve this. Just kill it. Let's put a 800 denier canvas on this thing. Nobody could tear into that. Put it on there. Release. Dropped it. Gashes tore the airbags lobe to lobe. And that was the moment that both of us thought, we may not make this. We may not launch this. They did develop a tick, even sort of like this. I used to think I could control it, but every time I wasn't paying attention, it would be going like this.
A month or so ago, the uh, head of the Russian Space Agency, uh, Mr. Kovkev, was here, and we showed him Rocky, uh, but we wanted to have more substantive technical discussions with people and, and uh, try to get some information exchange going. Donna Shirley was the team leader for JPL's rovers. She was also JPL's first female aerospace engineer. I got a lot of teasing and everything, but at the time, people were not interested in whether you were green or purple or blue or female or male or whatever. They were mainly interested, could you get the job done? The only thing really bad about it was that everybody smoked cigars in those days, and so they were literally smoke-filled rooms when you went to a meeting. There were other women at JPL who were doing technical work, but they were running these mechanical calculators. And these women were called computers because in order to do these complex uh, navigational calculations, they would run these calculators, ching, like a bunch of slot machines all running at the same time. And if they were taking square roots, it would be absolutely deafening in there. because so they did all the complex calculations, but they weren't engineers for the most part. Most of them didn't have degrees. They just uh, were smart women. Throughout Shirley's life, Mars kept appearing. Her introduction began as a child reading works of science fiction. Pretty much assume that either you know something. And now she was the champion for a Martian rover but finding the assignment a hard sell. And so when we say we have 20 And the scientists said, oh, that silly little rover, what on earth can it do? It can't do anything useful because they were used to the idea of a very large rover that would go 100 kilometers around Mars and collect lots of samples. And the lander talks to us and the lander has the hard job of getting the data back. As part also, of her pitch, she could data. point to a recent test that had put a rover named Rocky through its paces in the Pasadena Arroyo. Rocky began the workout by descending from a makeshift lander to the ground. Then it dropped off a simulated seismometer to detect Martian earthquakes. Next, the rover made its way to a rock where a small hammering device was to chip away at the stone's exterior. But here, Rocky experienced a major malfunction. All of these vibrations caused the rover's computer to lock up, leaving the rover pecking away in an endless loop. This glitch required a manual computer reset. Okay, we're ready to go. Launch. Okay, here we go. After the reboot, having regained its senses, Rocky picked up a soil sample and ambled its way back and up onto the lander. Something about the rover is a part of Measure Pathfinder, and we're a flight experiment. Whereas uh, Pathfinder... Once skeptical scientists were beginning to see real possibilities, this is just to, give you an idea of this. to Shirley's delight and Spears' dismay, NASA directed JPL to give the rover a ride to Mars. If a project manager is trying desperately to do something that nobody's ever done before for an incredibly small amount of money, and somebody comes up to him and says, gee, I want you to carry along this completely extraneous thing. Well, it looks to him like a parasite. <laughs> and so it was not popular with, with anybody. Say something about it. If you'll shut up for a minute, what? I'll say something about it. <laughs> um, I think that uh, actually... The funding for the rover came from a separate NASA pot. So Donna was appointed to be the project manager of the rover. The effort that uh, these that people immediately doing. created this slightly two-headed monster, where Tony thought he was in charge, and Donna had a similar feeling about it, and she was not going to let him tell her what to do, and he was going to treat her like a, a second-class citizen at some level. And that that sort of animosity between the rover team and the the quote lander team it lasted for quite a while. Stories of their yelling bouts were legendary. And the tension between these two headstrong managers only worsened 
when Shirley was promoted to also manage a newly established Office of Mars Exploration. Which meant I, Tony Spear, now worked for her. All hell broke loose. Besides a personality clash, there were difficult technical issues involved in accommodating Sojourner, as the rover was named. And it would still be Spear, as the Pathfinder project manager, who would recommend whether or not the rover would actually get a ride to Mars. Uh, that was a solar-powered mission. The inside of the panels had the solar rays. We were gonna take up space, volume and real estate that had to be tucked in there. And of course, the ramps. The ramps were a big, big, huge development activity to make these very lightweight, flexible ramps that would roll out off the edge of the tetrahedron panels. When we got to the point where we were doing environmental testing, we were in the chamber, and the rover couldn't handle the cold temperature. So they built this little dog, literally a doghouse for the rover, over on the side so the rover could crawl into it while we were doing cold temperature testing on the lander and it could basically be protected. The first time that the rover drove out, those pieces of tape confused the, the onboard algorithms and so it literally was afraid to drive, you know, out onto this, onto the floor. And so the lander guys, you know, all thought it was hysterical that here's this rover that, you know, is going to drive around Mars and it can't even figure out a way to drive in the flat chamber floor of, of Building 150. Another source of contention early on was whether the rover should operate autonomously as the rover team wanted, or should it be tethered to the mothership for power and communication. This one uh, manager at, at NASA, I would go back and brief. He was uh, listening to me, and I'm up walking around with my um, microphone, and I'm getting caught up in the, in, the, in the cord. He says, look at Tony Spear and his rover getting caught up in the tether. <laughs> he disavows, by the way, <laughs> that he ever did that. So I was getting nowhere with them. And one night, it was three o'clock in the morning where a lot of decisions happened. I realized, man, do you have a good team. I came in the next morning, I'm thinking, damn, I have the solution. And I say, I will let you do the rover without the tether. They were stunned. What I realized at three o'clock in the morning, if I chose their approach, they were gonna bust their butt to prove to me that I made the right decision. And it, it just happened like a flash. Hey, that's the answer. You know, get over it, Tony, you just do it. <laughs> With just one year remaining before the launch of Pathfinder, Members of the team put aside their hectic schedules to take a field trip to a place as close to Mars as exists on Earth. I thought it was a, uh, it was a bit of a potential for a boondoggle. I had a lot to do and I didn't think I had time. But Matt Gollenbeck says, Rob! You gotta go, you gotta go. As project scientist, you have to figure out where to land. And no one had done that since the Viking missions years before. How do you go about making a decision that's so important? Because you're not just throwing a dart that, you know, you wanna pick a place that has the greatest chance for success. If it's not safe, it doesn't matter what science you think you're gonna get. Golembeck's recommendation was to land on an ancient floodplain. And here on Earth, he was bringing Pathfinder engineers to a place that had once experienced a similar geologic event. This is the Scablands in Eastern Washington State a mostly barren region 
that experienced an almost unimaginably massive flood at the end of the last ice age. Why is this important? Well, because where we were going on Mars is a place where clearly we could see that billions of years ago, water coursed over the surface of Mars in exactly the same sort of cataclysmic flow of water. The place we were landing at was gonna be at least 10 times more dramatic, where even hundreds of feet high water, miles across, raced down the mountain and just completely altered the surface over the matter of hours and days, billions of years ago. We finally could visualize what the surface of Mars would look like. We could see the boulders and the rocks that had been formed in those conditions. We could see what the airbags had to handle. And Matt Gullenbeck saying, this is what it's gonna look like. And so there's a lot of rocks here, man. He says, yeah, that's right. We're going to Mars, we're going for rocks. And he says, yes, okay, great. The landing guys are going, but these are sharp rocks. I'm... <laughs> it was great fun. <laughs> And by the way, when you're this high above the ground as a rover, rocks this big are really scary. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to NASA headquarters and what promises to be a Interest in Martian rocks went sky high a year later when NASA Administrator Dan Golden set the stage for a controversial announcement the discovery of possible evidence that life once existed on Mars. First, the results today are not conclusive or there is not yet scientific consensus. We're not here to establish as in a courtroom beyond the shadow of doubt that life existed on Mars. But we're here today to open the door just a little bit. And we may see the first evidence that life might have existed beyond the confines of this small planet the third rock from the sun. The clues came from a rock that was blasted off the Martian surface by a meteor that hit the planet millions of years ago. After roaming the solar system, it too became a meteor when it entered Earth's atmosphere. This remnant landed in the Antarctic. Scientists found inside the rock structures interpreted by some to be microfossils of lifelike bacteria. The announcement caused a media sensation. As a thrilling discovery, a doorstep to the heavens, the possibility of life on Mars. It also gave NASA a new argument for sending more missions to Mars. Over and over, the stakes for Pathfinder were raised. A mission originally conceived as only a demonstration of a new way of landing on Mars had become the poster child to prove faster, better, cheaper could work. Then room had to be made for a pesky and demanding rover. And now, with the announcement of the Mars rock, NASA's hopes to expand its exploration of the planets was riding on board Pathfinder 2. Failure, Spear was told, was no longer an option. And I told everybody, you know, failure is okay, except on Pathfinder. I said to Tony Spear, you're not allowed to fail. <laughs> don't you dare fail. Do whatever you need to do, but don't fail.
Main engine start. One, zero, and liftoff of the Delta rocket with Mars Pathfinder. And the vehicle has cleared the tower. The launch was picture perfect. And as Pathfinder emerged from the shadow of the Earth, the spacecraft sent out the message that its solar panels were charging. For some unknown reason, though, the spacecraft's sun sensor, vital for navigation, was failing to see the sun. It's better than I expected, and I don't understand it right now. I need to analyze it. Because we, you know, we're getting out of the sun sensor for the view right now. Yeah, yeah. Without the sun sensor to help with navigation, the spacecraft would never reach Mars. And I hear power colleagues saying, you know, I see the sun in the solar arrays, and they are interrogating me, uh, ACS, do you see any uh, sun yet? I said, no, negative. No, we're getting out of the sun sensor for the view You're right on now. your point, what, 30 anomaly? And then I hear, you know, talking about, well, we see the sun, you know, and then I realize at that point, you know, I get, you know, this cold sweat. I'd like to report that the tilt is about 3.4 degrees. The problem was surmised to be debris sticking to the sun sensor. That would have occurred when the spacecraft separated from the final stage of the launch vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Can you report the temperatures listed in the procedure? So there was this anomaly with the launch vehicle. The scoop goes on the sun sensors, and we're looking and watching the data in the MSA. Do you have the telemetry you need to? It never to went to sun. It just said no sun, no sun, no sun, no sun, no sun. You know, being rocket scientists, we're like, we think the sun is there. <laughs> we think that the you know the sun sensors just aren't seeing it. Just made a spin ready, so it's screwed up, especially with the sun sensor glitch. Fortunately, one of the few backup instruments on Pathfinder was a second sun sensor. But to switch to it required sending up a software patch. I'm on console as a flight director, and I send, I send the first bundle of software to the spacecraft, and it worked fine, great. Then I do another one. Didn't work, what? Do it again, didn't work. It gets rejected, command error. That's strange. What's going on now? What's broken now? This, this thing's falling apart on me. Okay, now. The files were finally loaded on board by the peculiar solution of lowering the data transmission rate. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Had the fix not worked, Pathfinder would have been lost in the first few weeks of a seven month journey to Mars. During crews, the makeup of the Pathfinder team changed. Some members moved on to other missions. Others stayed on to rehearse surface operations. Whatever divisions there had once been between rover and lander teams were now long past, and the lab as a whole was showing more support for its maverick mission. An interesting thing happened. Everybody who felt that this was a mistake and that it wasn't going to work and yada, yada, yada. When, when you get to the launch pad, there's no reason for anybody to not want it to succeed. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody's your friend. Instruments that they can look good to the Roger, are you in entry mode? We are in uh, entry mode. And the wind science is set to low? Uh, yes. Battery temperature control. Friday morning, 
the 4th of July, 1997. No charge. Charge limiter. No charge. Crew solar array panels. One hour remained before the beginning of EDL, entry, descent, and landing. Hey, Mr. Flight Director and Mr. Flight Software. Yeah, we would go ahead. Got a question for you over here. Um, there's some concern as to maybe the possibility that the patch of the patch might not have worked properly. Is it valid? The message that came down from the spacecraft in telemetry said, you're on the old version of software. Is it valid for us to try and do a dump of the scum table and surface normal? I mean, if we got to do it, we have to do it fast before we actually do crew state separation. There's, that's like the only way we can verify the patch of the patch actually made it. Comments? And of course, this was the software that nobody wanted to use and we had not fully tested before launch, and so everybody panicked. That's not going to happen. It's not even that important. Let's not do it. Get, get it ready. I don't want to say that, but I do want to know that we are at least in the patch version of flight software. I mean, it's something with the hardware interaction. And what else is there? And this is in the last hour, right? It's like, let's reset the spacecraft and make sure we're running the right version of software. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not going to do that unless we have no other choice. The only command I could even conceive of sending is to send channel attributes to force those channels down. And, he, and if we do that, we don't have any action to take after that anyway, because we don't have any time. So it's... We were worried about it to the last minute. We're looking at the telemetry data coming back. And my mission director, he's looking at the data, and he's becoming worried. And CNN's cameras are blaring, we're all trying to smile. I says, Cook, how could you do this at this time? And that explains the last one. Yeah, what are the ones the last one? What about these? The team knew the original software was full of errors. If it was still running, the mission was likely doomed. Hoping to determine what version of the code was on board, the engineers began scanning their files looking for filler bits of information that had been added to the latest version of the software. Those bits included, as a memorial, the name of a JPLer who had recently died. They found his name, confirming the right software was loaded on the spacecraft. Another crisis was averted. But other issues kept coming. That just took three quarters of my downlink power. Yes, I understand. You know, where's Rob? That is not good. That's not good. same time, it's exciting as hell. The spacecraft now is about 7,500 kilometers above the surface of Mars. It's still traveling at about 7.4 kilometers per second. Very fast. We were all apprehensive. There are so many things that could have gone wrong, and everything had to go right. 30 seconds till entry.
I believe I have a firm signal that... I won the lottery. The feelings of the people, not, not just me, everybody in that room was incredibly relieved. Wes Huntress rushes into that room and he's crying beyond belief. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Thanks for trusting us, Wes. Yeah. Oh, you get him. You got guys are great. Tony and I hugged each other. Both of us just tears rolling down our face. It was. I knew you could do this, don't. I a technology demonstration. It was always known that the lander's battery would eventually fail. And on the 83rd Sol, as a day on Mars is called, rover, as she was pre-programmed to do, would have circled the lander, calling out to the mothership, listening for a reply 